Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening um, to all our listeners from all over the world. Welcome to the 15th interview in the COP interview series hosted by the UN Women Training Center's Community of Practice. My name is Ria Ligari. I'm the COP consultant for the Training Center, and I'm very lucky to be joined today by Dr. Jer Jeremy Goldbach, who will be speaking to us about addressing diversity, power, and privilege through training. And uh, before we begin, I should explain that this COP interview series is um, features a range of interviews with experts on topics that are related to training for gender equality and uh, this builds on our series in 2017 and this edition will run from July through to December 2018 and each interview lasts for half an hour and our audience members who are listening live have the chance to ask questions at any time using the questions tab on the right hand side of the GoToWebinar platform. The interview is being recorded and it'll be available on the Training Center's YouTube channel. And if you have any connectivity issues, you can select hide webcams, but that doesn't apply today because we're not going to use webcams. And uh, so without any further ado, let me introduce today's guest. Um, Dr. Jeremy Goldbach is an associate professor, the senior associate dean of faculty affairs and the director of the Center for LGBT Health Equity at the University of Southern California. He's also the author of a diversity toolkit, which you can see on your screens now, a guide to discussing identity, power and privilege. And this helps to provide a historical context about the politics of identity and the dynamics of power and privilege. It encourages discourse about issues of diversity at the individual and community levels. And uh, his research interests more broadly focus on diversity, on the experiences of sexual and gender minorities and ethnic minority youth. So Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, it's our pleasure. And uh, so we should begin, I guess, by talking about the diversity toolkit, which you've developed. And I wanted to ask you, you know, what the toolkit is, what it aims to do, what kind of issues it addresses, and who the audience is that you have in mind for the toolkit. Yeah, sure. I, um, so I think as we went into thinking about developing the diversity toolkit, what we were really realizing was that there are a lot of um, spaces in the world in which I think people want to be able to have conversations around power and privilege, diversity, racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, and heterosexism, um, but often don't really feel like they're equipped to do the, to have those conversations in meaningful ways that are, um, and that help to diffuse, um, you know, some of the natural defensiveness that we have when we get into these kinds of conversations. So often, um, when topics of racism and sexism come up, whether it's in the classroom or in the workplace, they're often very unexpected um, and usually um, result from somebody saying uh, an in, an in, making an insensitive remark, remark or um, often without even, I think many times without even realizing that they may have made uh, an insensitive statement. And then that sets up a dynamic often where um, there's sort of a defensive and offensive um, point um, and then you know at times people's feelings get hurt and they walk away from that situation generally both uh, sides feeling um, kind of inadequate inadequately served by the conversation so our hope in developing the the toolkit and then a lot of the trainings that i do um, around these topics is actually to try and help build um, a shared understanding of, um, of how to approach these kinds of conversations and offer just some basic uh, work kind of um, activities and and conversation starters to try and uh, allow these kinds of conversations to occur in more meaningful ways and in more structured ways so that hopefully uh, we can help to s sort of heal some of those um, some of the issues that have come out of power and privilege and um, the experiences of those that identify as um, part of a marginalized group. Mm -hmm. And are the is the audience mainly people who are part of the marginalized group, or is it just broadly for maybe students at USC, or is it for people at, at workplaces, or for everyone? Yeah, I, so our hope was to try and create something that would work in a lot of different contexts. So some of the activities, I think, certainly are geared well towards students in schools, but we've also had requests for um, trainings on how to use the toolkit in, um, in banks. Um, we had one, a large national bank actually reach out, say that they had come across the toolkit and wanted to speak to us about how they might incorporate that into their sort of training of, um, of their corporate level um, staff. So mm -hmm. I think 
the the toolkit itself is actually applicable across a variety of of, of situations we developed it in the school of social work at usc um in an effort to um in part to, to have to have our faculty feel like they can have some of these conversations in the classroom but we intentionally made the activities in the toolkit applicable across across a variety of settings so that it wouldn't it would be able to move beyond just kind of the academic environment mm -hmm. and i wonder so we're i think we're, we should talk about the activities that are in the toolkit but maybe before that like just because you've touched on the approach that you've taken in the toolkit and i think it's very evident when you go through it that um, it really prioritizes um, participatory learning and uh, critical reflection and sharing. And it's very open and I think very accessible. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the methodolo methodology of the toolkit. Like what kind of approach did you take and what kind of approach does it have in terms of, of learning and how to discuss these kinds of issues of gender and identity and power and privilege? Sure. I mean, I, so I think the main framework that we really take in this is the same uh, idea uh, framework that I try to take in training on these topics is that um, when we fall into this place of I'm I am marginalized and you are an oppressor, um, although that often, you know, results from our, for, you know, there's a lot of reasons for us to fall into those positions. Right. Um, but what tends, you know, including you know thousands of years of history of, of of marginalization and isolation and and oppression right so there there are certainly a variety of well you know well grounded reasons for sort of moving into these defensive places right um and what we often see is that the response then to that is the well i didn't ask to be privileged right so this is kind mm -hmm. of the age-old um this idea of white tears often we talk about um or um this sort of like um that often white white people in the example of racism will feel like well i didn't ask to be white right i didn't you can't blame me for that right and this idea that that sort of we move into this stance of like one person saying well you've offended me and the other person saying like well, i'm sorry if i offended you but it's not my fault and then we both walk away from that feeling completely um uh unsatisfied right with the outcome mm -hmm. of the conversation whereas when you take a social justice framework or a sort of power and oppression framework rather than you're bad and I'm good or you know you're the oppressor and I'm the oppressed um, if we try to move towards an idea that all of us actually hold multiple identities um, we all kind of walk through the world with um, socioeconomic status with gender with a race or, or and, and ethnicity with uh, religious or spiritual backgrounds with sexual identities gender identities um, our age right our education all of these different uh, areas of our life are places where we can hold marginalized uh, or target status or a you know a sort of oppressor or agent status right so when we try to teach people how to operate from this idea of multiple identities that we all sort of walk through this world not just as only white um, but we may also identify as gay or lesbian or we may identify as um, as transgender or we may identify as you know um, as male but also as latino and that these <laughs> identities kind of come together to create the sort of very complex person that we all are um, but when we're able to come from a framework of social justice or multiple identities that also invites us to have to be able to appreciate the experience of others without it being a negative statement about ourselves right so i can acknowledge the places in which i am privileged and i can also acknowledge the places in which i've experienced marginalization and that my privilege hasn't sort of um ended the world of hurt or you know or or in some way excused the ways in which i've experienced marginalization and if we can come together and have a conversation from that kind of shared perspective that that yes, in these ways I am privileged and in these other ways maybe I am not, and that you come to the table with your own set of privileges and, and your own set of oppressions that you've experienced, that that allows us to have a more real and honest conversation, um, mm -hmm. and that that framework then allows us to actually do some healing. So we really start the, um, we start the toolkit out with really a discussion of helping people understand what culture is, uh, what cultural identity is, and then the fact, and then trying to help folks understand that we all come to the table with lots of different identities, and that we get to be very complex people. And in some ways, that that complexity allows us to appreciate the experiences of, experiences of others, even if we can't share the exact experience with them. Mm -hmm. 
And I think, I mean, my next question really, I think, leads on from what you've just said. And I, I think really you've, you've, uh, you've answered it because I think this intersectional approach, intersectional approach that you, that you highlight really probably does a lot to get rid of the resistances that crop up so often in training and, and especially training for gender equality. And I wonder what kind of resistances you've experienced as in the past, maybe as a trainer, and that maybe you've um, you know, that have fed in and have informed the development of this toolkit. So what kind of resistances and how does the toolkit um, address these potential resistances? So I, I think in, um, you know, I think we're all, it's very easy for us all as people to see the ways in which we are marginalized. And it is often difficult for us to see the ways in which we have marginalized others because we want to most of us go through the world wanting to be good people, right? I mean, we, we want to do right by the world and we see ourselves as good people. And if we start to acknowledge that we have exerted agency over others because of our, tar because of our agent says, because say, because I'm a white man or identify mm -hmm. as a white man. When I have to acknowledge that I have possibly cut, a, you know, cut off a woman in a meeting, um, or made them feel that I've, you know, sort of like exerted my, you know, uh, I've mansplained, if you will, um, you know, which is sort of this this concept that's come up in the last few years. Well, <laughs> I think it's older than the last few years, but we've had a word <laughs> for it. <laughs> we've sort of had a word for it recently. Um, so if I have to, if I have to realize that because I I was raised in a world that taught me that when I walk into a room, I'm allowed to speak and that, you know, it doesn't matter who else is talking. Um, and I sort of follow, fall in line with that because that's sort of just how I was raised and I don't see it. I don't see that I'm doing it. When I start to acknowledge that I, that I carry racist beliefs as a white man, I, I, and, and I carry gendered beliefs that have been kind of programmed into me since birth, um, I have to acknowledge that there are parts of me that need improvement. Right. And that is a that is tough for people. Um, and sometimes and I think that's why we often sort of have this this knee jerk reaction to want to say, you know, um, but just because I'm white doesn't mean I didn't grow up without money or just because mm -hmm. I'm white doesn't mean that I didn't struggle. Right. And we have and we sort of see this dichotomy of that. We're either, you know, it, we're either the victim or the, you know, or, or the alternative. And. And we need to move away from that. So I think in trainings, we see that a lot where people are starting to kind of, you know, when you start saying, well, because you're white, that comes with privilege, whether you like it or not, um, you know, and we try not to be so blunt, obviously, um, we try to be gentle with people. But at the end of the day, that's sort of what we're saying is that like, when you're a man, that that's a that's a privileged status, you didn't ask for it. But you have that you hold that privilege. And the big question then becomes, um, Part of it is trying to acknowledge that, trying to help people understand that that is not to negate the other ways in which you've struggled. Those can, these things can co-occur. Um, and then once people start to kind of feel uh, a little more at peace with that, then I think the big question is, okay, so if you have privilege, now what are you gonna do with it? Mm -hmm. And do you think that's why training maybe is a, is a useful means of getting them to this kind of, like not just taking the acknowledgement or introducing them to the idea of acknowledging this privilege and then moving forward with it to to see how we can act on it is that why you chose training for example for um for for going down this path yeah i would say that i think trainings um in smaller groups it's, it really tends to work much better in much in small groups because um it gives an opportunity to sort of have some vulnerability um, and I think training and in spaces where you're with a group of a smaller group of people, it allows an opportunity for people to acknowledge their own biases, acknowledge their experience, um, validate each other. A lot of these trainings happen in workplaces that are outside of the um, the academy or the university setting. Um, and and I think one of the really critical things too, as folks that may be going out to train this uh, or to to work with the, you know, are interested in working these topics, one of the things that I have found has been most helpful is acknowledging my own privilege um, and really being open about about the ways in which I've struggled, right, and the times in my life when I have felt um, 
ashamed of the way that I handled myself in a situation, right? Or I felt um, that I could have done a better job um, or the times in which I've seen injustice happen even now, right? Um, you know, um, you know, even in recent history, I can come up with examples when I've come home and I've thought I, sh I should have stepped up. I didn't, I didn't do the right thing, right? I didn't, I didn't stand up for, for the, when I saw it happening in a meeting, I, I did not use my privilege to, to sort of uh, stand up for somebody else's experience. So, um, so I think that um, the training, being in a training environment is really helpful because it allows you the opportunity to be vulnerable with people. And then uh, a lot of times that sort of encourages people to feel like they can be a little more vulnerable with you. And in turn, with the people that they're um, in the training with, um, and again, a lot of times, as I mentioned earlier, people don't have the opportunity to talk about these things. Um, you know, when we start our jobs and we sort of go to work each day, we often don't expect that we're going to walk into a room and say, you know, today we're going to talk about racism and how racism, uh, you know, uh, uh, how we see racism in our in our corporate environment. Um, that's mm -hmm. often not a topic of daily conversation, but it doesn't change the fact that it's occurring. And so training, uh, when we kind of do these, they, they can be ways to interrupt that process. Um, again, I think the critical thing is that we're trying to build, we're trying to build people up. It's not about, it's the intention is not to just tear people, you know, and say, well, you're a terrible person. The intention is to say, we all have a responsibility to acknowledge our privilege. We all have a responsibility to use that. Um, and when we see injustice, when we see things happening, how do we engage, um, how do we do a better job of engaging and using our privilege to support people and be an ally to different communities? Excellent. And I wonder, like, drawing on from that, like, do, uh, could you describe one of the activities, like any of the activities that stand out in your mind from the toolkit? I, when I was going through it, I really liked the unpacking the invisible knapsack activity, which is about um, confronting entrenched systems of power and privilege and, and identifying common solutions, which I thought was a really good way of, of moving forward with that. Do you want to discuss any particular one that, that you like very much from the toolkit? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there are, no, it's hard for me to pick just one. Um, you can pick more if you like. Um, but um, I think that one of my, um, one of my favorites is the um, My Fullest Name um, mm -hmm. activity, which is an opportunity for people to get to know each other, and it's somewhat of an opener. But it also uh, helps people to understand um, the identities that we feel closest to and how um, our name may or may not represent kind of um, um, our story, right, our narrative. So mm -hmm. sometimes the, you know, the, how we got our name um, can be um, a really amazing and beautiful story. And for some people, it can be a traumatic story. Sometimes people have nicknames or other names they've gone by. And it's really interesting, I think, to see how, um, uh, I, I've always been surprised when I've used this activity that as I learn about people's names and you know what feels like sort of a simple, um, you know, our basic introduction to people is hi, my name is, right? And um, I'm always surprised at some of the stories that come out about the ways in which people have come by their names or people say sharing that the, the name that they use is actually different from the name they were given, um, you know, and, and how that came to be. So I've always found it to be a very small um, activity that, it, that often surprises me to learn about the history and kind of the, um, um, how it connects to that person's understanding of culture and family and shared identity and all of these really deep kind of um, the meaningful things when we often just think of a name as, you know, this basic introduction, so. Excellent, and well, I'd like to ask you then maybe how you got your name or at least what prompted, how did you become a trainer? What prompted your interest in this subject? Because. Um, yeah, no, um, I, you know, I, I <laughs> my, um, name, uh, I think mostly admittedly came out of a, a parent not one uh, who who disliked their own um, 
more uh, you know ethnocentric name and wanted mm-hmm. uh, my name to be one that was easy to uh, say and <laughs> easy to spell and could not be changed into a nickname. So I think my stories, you know, um, relates certainly to my parents' experience of uh, in the, in the U.S. But but um, interestingly, a little less to my own. Um, but um, uh, was there a second part? I'm sorry. Was there a second? Part? Yeah, it was just the idea of how how did you come to be a trainer? That did that affect your yeah. decisions? Like how come you became interested in these these questions, yeah. which are very interesting questions, but they're very big and very broad. And and yeah. what drew you to these specifically? So yeah, again, I I think going back to this idea that I've just observed in my own life and I've seen in others that um, the way that we the way that we often think about training is around these topics is from a so sort of a diversity or a cultural competence framework and a cultural competence frame in some ways and I don't mean to be sort of laissez laissez here but I think that historically cultural competence trainings tend to be you should like people that are different and and that we should sort of have this just kumbaya and say you know I I love people that are I love you know people that are women and I love you know, people of color, and I love all of these different, you know, lots of different faiths and lots of different backgrounds. And, and walking away from a training like that um, doesn't really actually get at the heart of, of what's really going on for people, right? Mm -hmm. And that, and what does it mean, for example, in the United States, what does it mean right now to be Latino or identify as Hispanic? What is it like to, you know, to, to, to be confronted with um, the prospect of deportation or to watch um, you know, uh, what's happening on the border around um, family separation or around building a wall between the US and Mexico, regardless of where a person falls in their belief system around those specific activities, there is a, I, be- I imagine, um, although I do not identify as Latino myself, I can imagine and relate in other ways as a self-identified gay man, um, that when those things happen, even though they're not about me specifically, that they affect me and they affect the way that I go through the world, right? So Mm -hmm. how do I help to, um, how do I help people that are not like me actually understand my experience of the world or my family's experience of the world? And how does that then help build their compassion and sort of reduce their stigma, right? So for me, um, you know, it, it's interesting. I always I use a story sometimes around um, thinking about um, st- how we stigmatize others. So the reason why we start this uh, our, this um, toolkit and also trainings around this idea of cultural identity um, is that cultural identity sets a frame for you're part of that group and I'm part of this group and our groups are different, right? And when you have that sort of distinction, which is not bad, there's lots of protective and positive things about distinguishing characteristics, but it does leave the room for one group to be stigmatized, another group to be, you know, to stigmatize, to be stigmatizing. And um, so I use this story of what's so interesting is when we break down these, when we when we cognitively reframe our perspective on other communities, that can really extensively change the way that we address the problems that they're experiencing. And so just as an example, um, you know, um, homelessness is a major problem. And there's, a you know, in the, in the United States that is, you know, we're, we're working to contend with. And homelessness is often seen as this intractable problem right this problem that we don't know how to fix or we can't seem to fix it and um and you know how do we sort of get people off the street well homelessness is also a highly stigmatized um you know identifying as a person who is homeless um comes with a set of stigma so a lot of time you know we can think of when you see someone on the street or when you hear people talk about why is somebody homeless there's a variety of reasons and stigmatizing identities that are often placed on people right they're, it's a moral failing. Um, they're lazy and don't want to work. They're um, a drug addict. They're right. There's all these things that we often place on people. And so we've come to accept to some extent 
that homelessness is just a thing that's going to happen in the world, right? And that like people will be homeless. And because we have all of these rationalizations, we can be okay with homelessness and still be good people because the reason that people are homeless is because they are doing some something that, that sort of shows their moral weakness, right? Or whatever it may be. Now, a couple of years ago, there was this new initiative that came out around veteran homelessness, right? And this idea that veterans as a group deserve better, right? Mm -hmm. And so suddenly you saw cities across the United States working towards these zero, the, these end veteran homelessness initiatives and several, including I think Philadelphia and, and cities. Um, and I think, um, I think Philadelphia was one of the first and several other cities in the country, in the United States. Um, suddenly we're saying we've we've ended veteran homelessness right we've reached zero if, if every veteran that wants to be housed is now housed and we we're having these big celebrations about how great we are now of course it's wonderful that we've done that right that we've found ways but but at the end of the day all that we really did was decide that this specific group should not be stigmatized and held in the same sort of identity group as other homeless people and then we reappropriated funding, which existed already. We didn't make new funding. We just moved funding from you know, other places to support this. And that sort of led to the ending of homelessness, right? Mm -hmm. So the power of holding these stigmatized identities and the ways in which entire structures can be designed and redesigned to either support, either push resources towards a group or push them or move them away from a group are really profound, right? So when we think about these dynamics of, of, of power and privilege in, and we teach people how to sort of have compassion for others, right? How to, how to understand another's experience, even if it's not your own, and how to acknowledge the way in which a community I may belong to may have historically been the cause of your, of your sort of uh, experience, right? Or your historical, your family's experience, that's not easy for me to acknowledge, but when I am able to acknowledge that, that also motivates me to want to change that, right? Mm -hmm. So if all I do is walk away and say, oh, they really thought I was being racist and I didn't mean to do that and I'm, you know, I'm a good person, nothing changes. Nothing changes in that except for everyone else the way feeling bad. But if I walk away, I'm able to appreciate that, um, that, that in the places in which I've been marginalized, that I can relate to you in the ways that you may have been marginalized, not entirely, um, certainly, but in some way I can appreciate that experience. It, it's motivating for me to wanna change that experience for you because in doing so, I'm gonna change the experience for me. Brilliant. And I think, well, since we're talking about motivation, I wonder if you wanted to talk a little bit about maybe a story that sticks out in your mind that, you know, a motivational story from one of your experiences as a trainer that whether you, when you've experienced or you've witnessed change in a participant or maybe even in yourself um, when you're in a training setting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of a lot of times I see, I think I see this happen in, um, often this, often this idea of multiple identities, I think is a place where people, that's, that's one of the key places where I see people start to break down their kind of barriers and their, um, their reluctance. And I think what's interesting is, um, I use an article a lot, um, in training by an author named Roxanne Gay um which is called peculiar benefits and can be found online by any of the your viewers um or people interested and it's an excellent piece about the sort of multi-dimensional nature of power and privilege i mean it's a really really wonderful piece and i open most of my trainings with that and one of the interesting things that she says in it is um she says you know um that we have we hold all of this privilege in the united states and she says something like um if you're re you know if you have access to the internet on a regular basis you have privilege and and she says if you're reading this article right now you hold some sort of privilege right mm -hmm. just the and just the idea that she's framing that like even having access to this information where wherever you are whether it's in an academic environment or training setting or a professional group or just because you're literally on the internet um mm -hmm. and i see this like often 
this kind of idea come up in our debriefing around this around you know I, especially among group folks who you know have been particular or have felt particularly marginalized right um um you know ethnic or racial minority women um you know folks that have, have had a lot of you know perceive that they've had a lot of challenges um say you know it is hard for me as a person who feels like i've had a I've had to struggle a lot, right? Because of certain identities that that often are the first um, kind of identities people see in me, right? Whether it's gender or race or ethnicity, um, and that sometimes those those experiences have made it difficult to see the ways that I've had privilege. Um, and I think that mm -hmm. that is a really powerful um, moment for people um, because it does allow us to have a more real conversation with each other right and a and a conversation that allows for more compassion because if we as members of a target group have difficulty seeing our privilege right um in different ways it makes it very hard for us to expect others to to do the same for us um and so i'd say that that's a really a place where i've seen a lot of people um just in a very basic way, start to click and say, yeah, you know, it's it's easy for me to see all the ways in which I've experienced, you know, hardship and challenges and discrimination and all those things. And and that I'm not devaluing my own experience just by acknowledging that I have this privilege. And in fact, the fact that I haven't done that up till now gives me a little bit of compassion for, you know, say the 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 white cisgender straight you know, Christian man in the US, right? Which is kind of our mm -hmm. classic stereotypical, um, you know, sort of a, a quote unquote oppressor. Um, and it's like, how do I, how can I come to a place where I can have compassion for this person um, that, that we feel that I may feel doesn't see their privilege, right? And then I start to understand that, well, if I'm not seeing my own, if I'm not able to see my own privilege, then is it, is it unrealistic for me to have this expectation that they see it, but I don't have to? Mm -hmm. That's, a, I think, a brilliant note for us to end on because we've done 30 minutes, but I think this, what you said about compassion and about, you know, becoming aware of our own privileges and realizing that other people can't just be expected to, you know, be self-aware in the same way of, of their privilege is a, is a really excellent note that you've um, brought out. And I wish we could speak longer, but we've only got half an hour booked. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no problem. So I want to thank you so much for for being with us um, today and uh, for sharing your insights. It was really, really enlightening and wonderful. And uh, we'll be posting. We've added um, your diversity toolkit as a link to our uh, COP resources section. So I hope many more people will be able to to check it out and to um, use it because it's a it's a brilliant tool. And uh, I hope we'll have a chance to to speak to you again on the training center. Well, thank you so much, and um, I look forward to it. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for being with us today um, for the COP interview. And uh, this will be posted on the YouTube channel um, directly. And, and thank you very much. Everyone have a great uh, morning, evening, and uh, afternoon. Thank you.